Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and there are many wonderful men and women doing wonderful work on behalf of the State of Israel and World Jewry through the major Jewish institutions of our community. And one of the truly extraordinary leaders serving Jewish life today is the man who heads the JNF, the Jewish National Fund. And you remember those blue and white JNF tzedakah boxes and those certificates you'd get for planting trees in Israel, JNF, the Jewish National Fund, which now does much, much more than plant trees in Israel. And what a pleasure it is to be sitting with a friend whom I've had the highest regard for and admiration for, Russell Robinson, the dynamic and amazing CEO of the Jewish National Fund. Russell, it's so wonderful to have you at this table. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for having me, Mark. It's a great honor for me to be here. You, boy, you've been serving since 1998? 1998. You were hired as the youngest kid ever to become the CEO of the JNF, right? Well, 1998, I was very young. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I want to talk to you about the JNF, but first I want to talk about you and who you are and how you get to be you. Um, so where were you born? So, unusual. I was born in that uh, real heartland of Jewish life, El Paso, Texas. Amazing. And, uh, You're the first Jew I've ever met who's been born in El, in El Paso. You know, Mark, it's when, when you sit around and talk to people about Jewish geography, and they talk Bronx and Brooklyn and uh, Connecticut and Cleveland, and then we get to El Paso, and the conversation usually <laughs> stops around the table. So, What was it like to be a Jew in El Paso? You know, you, you learn a little bit more after you get older than what you realize when you got young. We were a very small community, 1,500 Jews tops, and that's counting people who may not have counted themselves as Jews. You have two synagogues, two temp a temple, you know, the Reform Temple, which was across the street from my house. I didn't go there until well over, uh, until I was bar mitzvahed, because my grandfather was uh, um, somewhat orthodox, and so the conservadox shul, uh, was there, and uh, so, you know, that was the place you didn't go to. But in a small Jewish community, you, you, you realize later things that you sort of live with. Southern Jewish community, you understand, you hear, you didn't understand anti-Semitism. You know, the JCC movement really started because it was a place where we weren't, you know, we weren't allowed the other places. So there was a, a pool that wasn't far from my house, and, you know, Jews were allowed twice a year. But as a child, you, don't, you didn't think about it. Um, uh, they called the area in which I lived the police until the 1980s. Uh, they called it Nose Hill. Really? Um, and we didn't know about it because there wasn't ever a Jewish policeman until the 1980s. But, uh, mm -hmm. So those are things you learn as you grow up. But it was a, you also learn how to um, live Jew as a verb. And I think that it gives you a certain amount of Jewish character that you may not get in other examples. Oh, how interesting, Russell. Jew as a verb. So what did that literally mean for you growing? Do you have any siblings? So I have uh, three brothers. And what did your father do in El Paso? So my father worked very hard, as a, worked in a high fidelity store. My mother worked in a clothing store. Very hard working uh, uh, people. How long, how many generations is your family American? Uh, so I'm a sixth generation American. That's amazing, Russell. I don't think I've ever met someone like who came over in the 1790s and really the first Jewish settlers in Virginia, part of the group that moved to Virginia. Okay, so here you are, you and your four brothers, and you say you learn to live Jew as a verb. What did you mean? Listen, I lived first off as a Jew as a young child, um, and I know it's tough to say, disliking your Judaism. You know, I was the the Talmud Torah class uh, child. Um, uh, Sunday school, a bar mitzvah to all of us, not just to me, was the release from prison and a good cash flow opportunity. Um, 
Now, That's the shame so about that is that is that it was true. Yes. Uh, you didn't live it. But I had a grandfather, my parents as well, but a grandfather who constantly talked about how wonderful it was to be a Jew. And I, by luck, I have to tell you, one of my friends took me to a BBYO convention. And it was the first time that I saw Jews dancing and having that kind of fun. It wasn't about how... Um, heavy it was to be yes. a Jew, how, yes. how, you know, we were persecuted and, and, and how we had, uh, six million Jews had, had passed away in the Holocaust and had been killed in the Holocaust. And, and so you, you, you know all those stories, but if that's the reason for your existence, then as a child, you know, it's not a winning for, formula. I learned that it was a winning, winning formula. And I, I have friends, and, and, and you take from El Paso, I have uh, uh, one of my dear friends who grew up with me, she's in the Jewish communal work in Houston, Texas. I have another one who's a rabbi. Uh, we have people who, who really were challenged because they had to live it as a verb and live it as the winning formula of who we are as a Jewish people. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always a tension that we have teaching our children. When do we teach them that, that anti-Semitism is such a reality for Jewish history and Jewish life and the Holocaust, only because you've mentioned it, it, do you have any suggestion for when, at what point in time, the formal Jewish community tries to present this part of Jewish existence to young people? And I'm very sensitive to the fact that you're making a point you don't want to create in children Jewish identity based on anti-Semitism or the fact that we endured the Holocaust. But at what point does Russell Robinson say, yes, at this point, it's meaningful to teach it to young people or children? The meaningful has to incorporate why is there anti-Semitism, which is hard to understand because there's no real rational reason for it. They hate Jews. So what does that mean to the hate Jews? So our existence can't be because they hate us. We have to dig, and, and what I've done with my children, I hope, I believe I have, I, I do at the Jewish National Fund, and in my own constant, constant dialogue with people, we have to talk about how great we are. Yes. How great we are. There is no people on the face of the earth like the Jewish people, period. Why is that so hard for people to say? There is no people on the face of the earth that have a land as part of their existence. Lech Lecha, go forward to a new land. Not Christians, Muslims, not Hindus, not Baha'i. Nobody has a land. Uh, the Vatican was located in France many times. It was a good piece of property in Rome. It has nothing to do with the spiritual connection to them as, as, as the Catholics. We have that. that. Who brought laws and ethics? arts and sciences to the world, the Jewish people. So let's teach that. When you get to anti-Semitism, it's so irrational. It's not to teach that there is anti-Semitism. That will be. And, and you will see it, and we have to inform that people don't like us, mm -hmm. and there is a reality of it. You saw it just recently, and you see it every single day. But then you have a child say, so why do they hate us? Well, because of history. What do you mean because of history? That, that denies our right for what we stand for. It's not because of history. There's no rational reason for anti-Semitism. We are a great people. I don't have the answer to my son and my daughter about why people hate us. I do have an answer that we're a great people. That's lovely. Did you and your brothers experience anti-Semitism? Of course. Of course. And uh, you experience it again when you're in a small town and when you're growing up. Uh, there's a generation, and, 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 and my parents were very proud Jews, but there was, a, a, I think, a generation that we wanted to be good Americans. Now, I don't know if there's, I, I think you'd be a great Christian and a great American. So if you can be a great Christian and a great American, why can't you be a great Jew and a great American? But I think that we had the historical, that's where anti-Semitism comes, pressure upon us that we weren't sure if we could be both. And we denied ourselves what other people were. Mm. Good Catholics, good Americans. We were great Jews and great Americans. But we tried to be great Americans and eh, let's go with J Jewish with a small J. So you experience it. 
you, you, you feel it. You feel that you're somewhat different. You have the words that are spoken to you. I believe that even where I told you I disliked my Judaism as the ritual, I was so proud to be a Jew. And I loved being Jewish. You loved being Jewish? Without, even as a kid? Yeah, even as a kid, with the Jewish ritual part was just the drag on me. I didn't understand. So what did you love? What, what was it that you loved? I loved, you know, in my home, and we didn't have much. But if there was a holiday, we had people. I didn't have to understand it all. But I understood that this was something Jewish. That's lovely. I understood that my father would do things and my mother would do things for people who were of need when they were of need. But it was Jewish. That's a verb. I understood that we had a responsibility to make the world a better place. That was taught to me. That's a Jewish experience. And that is what got me, and then seeing it, and dancing, and loving it, and seeing people coming together. Why? Because we are, and we feel great about each other. That Jewish experience, that made me love being a Jew. You know, you've said it now in many ways. It's all about people, isn't it? It's all about people. All about people. Yeah. Okay, so BBYO, and the dancing, and you would love it, and where'd you go to college? So, you know, I grew up in Texas, and I think there's a law that you have to go to <laughs> Texas. Um, you have to eat steaks and go to Texas. And, uh, and I started my own business. I was in private industry. Uh, I started a carpet cleaning business. And, wow. And uh, we started it on a, sh on a shoestring and uh, in a prayer and built it up into a very large business. How lovely of you. So how do you end up in Jewish communal work? So this is an interesting story. In El Paso... You know, you start making money. One of the people that was running, wanted to run a resident camp, uh, tapped me on the shoulder and said, uh, you know, I'd like you to help put together a committee. So I, I thought it was money. He asked me to chair it. I didn't know what I was doing. A kid, he did all the work. He told me the great Jewish professional lie, don't worry, there's nothing to do, <laughs> which, you know, means you have to show up to a lot of meetings and do a lot. But about three weeks before the camp started, the JCC had fired him. Well, I figured, how hard is it to run a resident camp? It was the hardest job of my life. I never went to camp. I fell in love with the whole experience and decided to sell the business and go into the Jewish communal field. No kidding. And what was your first Jewish communal job? Running this camp and working at the JCC. So it was a Jewish camp? Yeah. So you caught all the camping experience, the Jewish camping experience. And I never went as a child. One but day. you loved it anyway. I couldn't, you know, when you have a young man who at that point was uh, 12 years old and had experienced his third Shabbat and was crying about going home and it wasn't about the horseback riding, but it was about lighting candles and enjoying Shabbat. Not, again, because it was, uh, he, I mean, I, I don't know if he knew the prayers. But there was something wonderful about lighting that candle and closing your eyes and imagining that the sundown had come and, and to talk about it in the week that was. And I said, look, it, if I can make those kind of differences on people's lives, let me, let me have that opportunity. That's beautiful. And then you also were with the JCC? So I was with the JCC. I then, uh, uh, a lot of different stories of why, but uh, by accident, I ended up to be going to work at the UJA, at the National UJA. In New York? Uh, well, I worked at that time in Chicago. Uh -huh. And uh, I became, worked up, became the number two of the National UJ before their change in uh, pace. And I was going back to private industry and Ronald Lauder, who had just become the president of uh, JNF. I didn't know him at the time. He had called me and under uh, uh, the pretense that he wanted to get some advice. So if Ronald Lauder <laughs> wanted to get advice, I'd love to meet Ronald Lauder anyway. And uh, I spent about 20 minutes in his office and realized that the advice was an interview. We started talking. I told him I was going back to private industry and I had had another job offer. And uh, he told me, you don't want to do that. And I always told Ronald that he harassed me for a couple of days and uh, talked me into taking the job at Jewish National Fund. He was the new president. I became the new CEO. Um, I really wanted to, in nonprofit world, to be able to put a business sense into an organization. Uh -huh. So I took it as that challenge. I always have said to people, 
nonprofit is a tax status, not a philosophy. And too many times in our business of nonprofit, we we think you know that it's okay to lose money. It's, we have the opportunity to risk. We shouldn't plan on the loss. You know, 98% of cancer research is a failure for that 2% gain. But that gives you the right to do it, but it's not the right to think that you're going to be 98% yeah. unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. So I all of a sudden got into it, got into the business part of it, and fell in love with the mission part. And to this day, and I'll tell you, Mark, uh, you know me, I wake up, I love what I do. I love the people. I love the impact that, that, that we make. I, with all the frustrations that you could have in this business, with all the people that want to uh, throw eggs and attack and other people that want to put you down, this is an opportunity that I get and I pinch myself every day. That is lovely. It's probably why you're extraordinarily good at it. What about the Israel component? When Ron Lauder quote, interviews you in this way. Did you, at that point in your life, have a commitment to Israel? A hundred percent. Where did that come from? That came from, you know, and I didn't go to Israel until late in my life because, of, you know, I didn't have the finances and it was not until I even started working at uh, UJ. And I fell in love and I understood, again, you talk about the people. You know, we have this connection to this land. The land, as I used before, Lech Lecha, so we can't get away with it as a Jewish people. If you want to be a Jew, you're connected to Israel. There is no, uh, no debate. You know, it's part of our everyday being. We have that opportunity. And I fell in love with the idea that not as a place of just refuge, that, you know, exiles. You know, I tell people, it's part of my, my constant speech today, is that the exile experiment of Israel, we won. Mm -hmm. You know, and I saw that happening. I was able to see Jews come from Ethiopia. I was able to, to participate in, in Aliyah from the former Soviet Union. But we won. And I saw that and I loved that feeling about being part of that, that soil of Israel that became part of the soul of my life. That is gorgeous. Uh, does your entire family share some of this with you? Yeah, it's one of the beautiful things. Uh, you know, my children have all been to Israel many times. My daughter uh, uh, has spent a semester abroad there and uh, my, she, in, in high school, and she's gone. She works, she's worked there over the summer. My son has come with me many times, my wife. And so we, we take our family. This past summer, uh, you know, I do this all the time, but I tell, always tell relatives, friends. I've had all my brothers. I've taken my, I took my parents before they passed away. And I always say, you know, if you ever want to go to Israel, tell me. So this summer I had 13 cousins. You know, the, like eight years ago, I had said it. I never realized it really would come around. But it's okay. I, it was one of those great, you know, 10 days in Israel to show people who were part of your family uh, a place that you love and, and to touch it. So I have that, 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 uh, uh, that really um, uh, great opportunity of my family loving all of this that I do. How lucky you are. Is there one or two uh, in terms of all the time you've been to Israel? Are, is there one or two, are, are there moments that stand out for you, that touched you, that moved you, that you, know, you say they were either <coughs> defining or there are moments I will never, ever forget in Israel? So my first trip, my grandfather never went. He never went on a plane. And he, he, I, he passed away before my first trip to Israel. And he said to me, if you ever get to Israel, I want you to go to the wall. There's a man who's never been to Israel. And he said, I want you to walk up to it. And I said to him, Gramps, I'm not religious. He said, uh, not for religious. I want you to do something else. And I want you to imagine what I'm telling you, Mark. This comes from a man who had never been there, never traveled on a plane. He said, I want you to touch the wall, and I want you to turn around. And I want you to see the people that are coming to this wall. And I want you to see their faces, the different looks, the different colors. And I want you to know that that has been happening for generations and generations and hundreds and thousands of years. 
and you get to participate in that. So I never thought about it. You know, you hear it from grandfather passed away. I go to my first trip to Israel. I'm going up to the wall. And I walk slowly. And I touch the wall. And I turned around. And I saw Yemenites. And I saw Ethiopians. And I saw Ashkenazim. And I couldn't believe this picture that my grandfather had painted for me that was so real. I don't have to understand it any further than that. That's an extraordinary story and an extraordinary image. It gives me chills. What was your grandfather's name? Sam Rosenberg. Sam. He was prescient and brilliant, you know. You were very lucky to have him. Yes. And it's nice that you remembered what he'd asked you to do and that it worked so well for you. So you said very honestly that it wasn't the ritual of Judaism that was important to you growing up. Out of curiosity, did at any point in your life ritual or Jewish observance or Judaism in that sense take on a different meaning for you or your children or your family? So, you know, sometimes you become a resistant uh, 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 religious person. So my, my children are day school children. And when you show up to uh, Kaddish uh, somewhere and, and your son gets up there and can lead uh, the service, uh, you're, wow. 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 And uh, my daughter can read Torah. Wow. Wow. So, you know, I, and I say this because it's, it's really something that is a challenge that's far beyond my pay grade on the American Jewish community, how do we make the Russell Robinsons today not experience what Russell Robinson experience in the ritual piece? And I don't have that answer, but, I, but, I, but it's happening every single day. And the shame is, is that it shouldn't be that way. And so, you know, do I love it when, you know, our daughter cleans our house out for Pesach? Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, there's... Uh, you ask where it comes, it comes from that. Mm -hmm. But does it mean that it is something that I uh, do as an everyday experience? No. But am I aware of it? And I think that that is, again, it's above my pay grade. It's a great challenge to, to all of us. There are the majority of the Russell Robinsons out there. And the majority of them are not enjoying their Judaism. I was lucky. And I don't think that we're losing Jews. You know, it's not because of them, it's because of us. What do you mean? It's not a young Jew who wants to assimilate. It's not a young Jew. People talk about intermarriage. And you say, well, it's terrible. They're, well, why? You can't, why? Why are they? Well, you can't tell them. What do you mean you tell them? It's not, you know, there's not an order here. Uh, you must uh, love Judaism. So we have to bring that spirit. And I believe, and I'll take you to the JNF side, what we do on college campuses is the Jewish National Fund, which is positively Israel. We have to get beyond conflict. We have to get beyond the issues of, of that. And I understand education. But at the end of the day, people have to decide that that is the team that they love. And I use sports analogies in our Judaism all the time. If you are a Giants jet or, like me, a beautiful Cowboy fan, um, you love that team. You buy season tickets. You paint your children's face. You buy the scarves. You go to every game until they lose. Now you love them. You're a diehard fan, and the weather's not so great. So you tell your son and daughter, you know what, let's watch it on TV. And they lose. And then you start changing the channel. We have to have the winning team, and they'll show up. They bought the season tickets when they were born. Let's make it a winning uh, team that they want to come to our stadium and participate. How do we do that? When so much of what we see, and you, know, you deal with young people all the time and college campus all the time, 
And I do want to talk to you about all the things that JNF is doing. And you heard me say in the open, it's not about tree only trees anymore. Um, but one of the things I did want to ask you is what your sense is of the current, when I say younger generation, I'm not talking 20s. I'm talking 30s and 40s. Where are they in terms of Jewish commitment to Israel and Jewish philanthropy? Which, when you grew up, philanthropy meant something very different than it means now to young Jews and Jews in their 30s and 40s. But you know, the sports analogy is fabulous. It also, by the way, you understand, it's all about people. Mm -hmm. being, being part of a team or rooting for a team is rooting for people. It's not about a piece of laundry. It's not a logo. It's, you know, for you, it's, you know, Landry and Staubach and all, you know, all the great people who made the Cowboys whom they are. And, you know, in, in your experience. And, and so the question becomes for me, when I love the analogy, how do you make Israel the winning team when at the moment there is so much out there that is critical of Israel, the BDS movement, the extent to which college campuses are less and less hospitable to the young Jew who supports Israel. You've given this so much thought, and, and I, I don't want, you know, I'm, it's stupid for me to say to you, well, what's your formula? But I do want to know what your instincts are here and how you're trying to combat a, an insidious time in, in the life of the Jewish people and how you're trying to, again, encourage young people and older people to be you know, not only rooting for the team, but to participate with the team. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what you said, Mark, and show you how my, my image is 100% correct. You named people from the Dallas Cowboys. You're not a Cowboy fan. But there was a winning formula, winning image, winning names that even those names, the Starbucks and Landry's. So now let's take it to the Jewish people. Now I'll take your second question. What's happening to the 25, 35 year olds? We are in the greatest space that we've ever been. The greatest space. Think about this. I will tell you from a Jewish National Fund, we have a group called JNF Future. It's 25 to 35 year olds. I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. It's our fastest growing division at Jewish National Fund. Really? So 25 to 35? 25 to 35. What's your secret, ah. Russell? So you say philanthropy is different. So is the telephone. Okay? <laughs> so allow them to come in and be entrepreneurial in their thoughts. This organizational life that we have is, is somehow we built this box and we think that this is the only way it works. We have to change. We have to be challenged by them. We have a group of young people on JNF Future that we take every year to Israel. We only take 25 of them because of budget. We could take, we have over 150 to 200 that get uh, uh, recommended on a leadership journey of Israel to how to be change agents for the Jewish world. Jewish world, not just Jewish National Fund. We want them, and one of the things we tell them we want them, and we bring lay leaders as their, as their cohorts, I mean, into the cohort to, to be able to be mentors to them. And we tell them, if you challenge us, you are successful. Don't get frustrated with us and the bureaucracy. There's a lot of bureaucracy. Guess what? That's how I operate that way. If you give up, you're no leader. That is number one. Number two, the growing piece, and I'll give you some stories about our JNF future. In New York City, we have a program in Shabbat in the Park. Now, Shabbat in the Park is in Central Park. Now, I'm telling you the numbers, not to impress you with the dollar, but to impress you with them. I think it costs $225 a person. Really? So it's not cheap. No. We sell out in four days. 500. No invitation. How do you do this? Because it's a winning formula. They know that it's a winning event. They know that they're going to get top quality. It's not paper plates. It's China. It's the kind of event that they are, should have, and we should be giving them that kind of respect. What is the event? What happens? The event is at Shabbat uh, in Central Park. What do you mean in Central Park? In Central Park, at the zoo in Central Park. We have 500 young people. 
I have more of my generation that constantly want to go there. I can't because you can't take a, the a capacity. And we have a program that starts, and then when Shabbat ha ha starts, they have a Shabbat dinner with dancing and with song. You have Jews that are religious and secular coming together for celebrating what? Israel. Making the world a better place. Letting them understand now, let me talk about Israel as you brought it. Israel, I don't apologize. There's an African farmer today bringing food onto their plate because of a water technology created in a place called Israel. Israel makes the world a better place. And we have to tell the relevant stories to our young people. And that's what we do, Jewish National Fund does on college campuses in a variety of ways. One is we bring a program called Positively Israel. Go on Facebook, go to our website, positivelyisrael.org, or like our Facebook page. And what we do on college campuses is bring relevant issues. Mark, it's not relevant, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. You and I could sit here and talk for the next four hours, and we'll get together tomorrow and speak another four hours. So on a college campus, you think that that's relevant? But it is relevant about people who've been saved because of a pill cam created in a place called Israel. Israel makes the world a better place. Now, the BDS movement is not about Israel. And I refuse, and we should always refuse to allow it. It has nothing to do, it's about democracy. If you are for BDS, you are anti-democracy. You are on the bring down of morality. That it's a no other time in, the, in our history except for Holocaust and others was there such a definition so clear. Mm -hmm. And we make a mistake allowing it to be called about Israel. It has nothing to do with Israel. It's about morality and immorality. It's about right and it's about wrong. And it's about democracy or anti-democracy. And if you are for BDS and you're against America, we have to be very clear about those things and not get caught up into it. Yes, and just, just to be sure people understand what you're saying, why is being for BDS, the boycott, divestment, sanctions against Israel, against America? Because it's the shared values that we have. You have to, you know, it's what side you're on. You know, Mark, it's, it's not that you're for... Uh, uh, two Democrats, you're not for Canada or United States. Okay, that's not the, you, you, you're talking right now, you're either for Syria or United States. And if you're divesting from Israel, divesting sanctions against Israel, that's what we're doing with Iran. Think about it. So who's doing it? The United States. We have to be put in the right columns and allow them to be known that they're in the wrong columns. Now, you could have concerns for the issues. And you could be a very, very concerned individual for all of the issues that face Israel. And we don't hide from that on college campuses. And we don't hide from that from Jewish okay, National Forum. What does that mean, you don't hide from it? You know what? There's an issue with the Bedouins in Israel. It's real. Bedouins are second-class citizens in Israel. It's wrong, and they're Israeli citizens. And no one does more than Jewish National Fund than the, for the Bedouins than we do. Jewish National Fund? Because if we're going to bring 500,000 people to the Negev, there's 200,000 Bedouins in the Negev. Mm -hmm. They can't run at 98% unemployment. They cannot be poor because poverty brings all the other issues out to life. Mm -hmm. That's a real issue. And we should tackle the issue, and we shouldn't hide from it. What do you do with the claim on college campuses that Israel is brutalizing the Palestinians with occupation on the West Bank and with a blockade of Gaza? So I don't deal with the, the uh, and if you were asking me that on the college campus, and I said that this is very complicated issues. And if you want to have a real discussion on complicated issues, you cannot have it in this kind of a forum. But if you would like to have that kind of, an, uh, of, a, of a conversation, we should have it, and we should have it in a separate forum. But in I, this forum... You don't run from it. Oh, 100% I don't run from it. There is absolutely issues. Absolutely issues. But by the way, there's issues on our, our Mexican border. 
in America. That's a very complicated issue. And I don't think that I, and, and it would be right for me to answer the issues about illegal immigrants coming from Mexico into the United States in a question and answer session here. But let me tell you what I do want to talk about. I want to talk about cancer research and saving human lives. And I want to talk about people who are now walking because of a rewalk that was created in a place called Israel. Where in the history of mankind, Mark, where did an evil empire create such good? It can't be. I want to raise the question to people to ask yourself the question. Can this all be true? You know, in 1948, we all started with the same broken down tractor. Okay, there's a dispute on property. And I will tell you that there's a real estate dispute. It doesn't justify killing. But what did we do as a Jewish people? Yeah, we planted 250 million trees. Why? We have agriculture down in the Arava. This is the Jewish National Fund story. Down in the Arava, between the Dead Sea and Eilat, a place that gets two inches of rain a year that comes all in two days. 50% of the melons that are exported from Israel come from there. 25% of the fish that's consumed in Israel come from there. That's the Jewish National Fund story. That's taking your resources and talking about building life. Mm -hmm. And if we talk those stories, we win the battle. Mm -hmm. If I want you to empower you to want to learn more, and I believe my story's correct, I win. But if I want to try to debate you on those great statements that you want to make, we both lose. I understand, and you say it so brilliantly. I hope everybody's listening and learning from you. I want you to mention some of the other JNF projects right now, which you feel are making a unique contribution to Israeli life and therefore to the life of the world. Because again, um, some people don't know what you do at all. Some people only think of JNF and think of trees. And so take a moment. And give me two or three of the projects that you really would love our audience, Jewish and non-Jewish, to really appreciate that the JNF is doing that. So I'm going to first use the word and change it, because we don't do any projects. Zero. We do vision. Under vision, there's a lot of projects. But the difference in that, Mark, is that we measure those projects on the rippling effect of what they make. So we set our goal many years ago, 500,000 people to move to the Negev. People laughed at us 15 years ago. We started working in Beersheba. At that time, Beersheba was 193,000 people losing 3% per year. Today, Beersheba is 225,000 people, the fastest growing city in Israel. So we changed to 3% and increased. How did we do it? By vision. We took a dry riverbed in the middle of the town seven miles long, and we created a river park, three times the size of Central Park. In five years, we're going to have water running down the middle of Beersheba. Abraham's well, you may not have known it was in Beersheba because it was behind a lock fence. We built a $6 million visitor center there and turned Abraham's well into a place in which within nine months has already had over 100,000 visitors. That over 100,000, we'll have 200,000. Now, I tell you the rippling effect. It's not Abraham's well that is the significance of it. But it's on the river walk. 200,000 people, do you know how much cafe a fuch that is and falafel? <laughs> so it's an economic generator for the earth. That's how Jewish National Fund thinks it through. So this $300 million project with an amphitheater, 13,000 seats, the largest entertainment venue in Israel, built by, powered by Jewish National Fund, is turning Beersheba into truly the capital of the Negev, in partnership with the people of, of, the, of the city. And throughout the Negev, when I say to the Arava, to Yoracham, to places that people forgot, we didn't forget. Yes. By the way, just because there may be some people who don't understand, the Negev is the south of Israel. And in many ways, it's, it's thought to be simply pure desert. And we don't mean desert like, you know, a lot of Arab sand. It's rock and it's... It was once thought to be uninhabitable, Russell, and you've changed the entire model through the vision. 
that that vision, my my donors, my lay leaders, everybody that's involved in that is able to create a place that should be 60% of the land of Israel. 60 is the Negev. It used to have 6% of the population, now has 9.5%. So another role that we play is, I call it the APAC for the Negev. <laughs> because who cares? I'm not talking in, 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 in theory. But politically, if you're running for Knesset, you can get more votes in a suburb of Tel Aviv than the Negev. So you may care about the Negev, but and by the way, it's the American, we go to Iowa and, Nebra and, and, and New Hampshire until we get, uh, uh, win the primary, and then we never go back to Iowa and New Hampshire. So don't go back to the Negev. We become that lobbying agent for those people in the Negev who were forgotten. And that's 60% of the land of Israel. You have to bring population or you lose. Mm -hmm. And we're not losing, we're winning. Mm -hmm. Water, resources. When we started working on water, Ronald Lauder and myself and the Jewish National Fund over 15 years ago, people have said to me, you know, Russell, you're going to have a very short tenure. Nobody's going to raise money for water. You need to have children in a bus and, and a picture of a poor child somewhere. Water. Well, I'm very proud because now there's so many organizations that use water in their story, or if you talk to any Israeli politician, they'd love to say 78% of, of Israel's water is reused. 78%, the country next to it is Spain at 17%. When we started, it was 2%. It was the Jewish National Fund involvement that brought that great mm -hmm. statistic to life, mm -hmm. that every drop of water is too precious to only use once. And we brought water that's equivalent to 1.8 million Israelis having water every year. Now, it's not drinking water. It's the water for that farmer, that Zionist farmer, who tilled that land down in the Arava or up in the north. And I have to tell you, their farm could have been dug up the next day. It's one or two votes. Or you raise the price of water in Tel Aviv and lose your election. We were the lobbying agent for the land of Israel. Or today in the Go North, working and, and bringing people to the North. 17% of the land of Israel. So take 60, take 17%. That's a very big part of greater Israel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not going to get into politics. I'm just going to tell you that is a big number. Mm -hmm. And that big number is what we're involved in. Working with nefesh benefesh, soul to soul, bringing Jews, North Americans to Israel. Bring them to the North and to the South proudly. Because we're telling the story, not of the Jew that has to go to Israel because there's no place to call home. We have a home. We have to say, if Israel's really everything we wanted it to be, by the way, Israelis have a choice as well. You could choose to move to L.A. or New York, or Nebraska. It's a free country. It's democratic. And we have to make Israel, why not, a place that a Jew from America and Nefesh Benefesh has brought over 40,000 North Americans to make Aliyah in 10 years. Our, we have to be extra proud, not scared of saying the word. That is the Jewish National Fund story. That's our vision. It's not projects. We're involved in mm -hmm. that, making a difference. And the beauty is, it's our opportunity and our right. We very proudly at Jewish National Fund say that Israel is a country of 14 and a half million Jews. Eight million live within its borders. <laughs> I don't want to try to say, oh, look at Russell and compare him to anybody else. I want to say, however, it's not the way most in Jewish leadership speak. And there is a, um, not only a reactive mode of Jewish leadership, but there is a, a, um, a defensive posture. You don't have a defensive posture. As you look at, you know, the way in which the Jewish community is operating, what gives you, on the one hand, some real, you know, some joy, but, you know, you are courageously outspoken. What really, at this point in Jewish history, bothers you and troubles you? So, it's a, you know, sometimes I'm better not to talk, <laughs> but especially when you're talking to, you know, your millions of viewers on your right. show. But... Um, you know, Mark, I believe that Zionism is a beautiful word. 
And we have to speak about it with that big Z, zealot, really zest in our life. I'm disappointed when I see people run away from it. Yes. And we have to stand up and make sure that our organizations and our organizational leaders do not. Two, we have to take back Zionism for all the Jewish people. Uh, you know, that we have to be involved in, the, in, in what happens with all of these systems in Israel, and this is the sad parts, that become so politicized, and they have robbed us of that participation, and we have to break it. We have to be involved in it. We cannot allow ourselves to be pushed away from it. We have to work closer together. You know, birthright is great, and it's a proof that things can happen. But what happened was you had big philanthropists that finally just bullied the system to do it. I mean, you know, everybody could take a lot of credit, uh, yeah, but I was there at the beginning of Birthright and nobody was giving credit. They were all telling you how it wasn't going to work. Simplicity works, it does. But we have high school kids. And today, we take a dismal number of high school kids on high school experiences. College is great. I have to tell you, I want to catch them before. So at JNF, we uh, acquired the Alexander Musk High School in Israel. It's an academic school in Israel, a semester abroad for public schools or non-Jewish day school kids. And we want to bring 5,000 a year where we're bringing 1,500. Academically, we'll give them everything they need. They'll have the best in calculus and the best in biology. But we'll also give them the best in leadership and the best in Zionism in Israel. They'll come back and lead this Jewish community for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We have to invest in our high school programs and bring high school kids to Israel, and I don't see it. We have to engage in people working together without the logo egos of our organizations mm -hmm. on college campus. Mm -hmm. Look at what's happening on college campus. I was told the other day that the number is about $250 million to $300 million are spent on college campuses per year. If you take all of the work infrastructure, all of the shalkim, all of the workers, all of the buildings, we have 250,000 kids on a college campus. I don't know, I've been in business. I would get out of that business because I think it would be cheaper to give everybody about $100,000 if they just say they'd be a great Jew and love Israel. We can't have that. We've got to build that spirit of involvement. What do we care if it's the initials that they're involved in? In college life, we want them involved in Jewish life and in Israel life and let them be bright enough that, guess what, when they come back from birthright, they may be involved in AJC or ADL or JNF or UJA. And guess what, I'm hoping that we taught them enough in life that they'll be involved in one of our alphabets. Mm -hmm. But instead, we are very good as a Jewish community to say, no, 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 let's don't tell them about the others. Let only tell them about this. And guess what? Maybe this doesn't fit them. We're turning them off. Mm -hmm. So that's where I say, Mark, it's about us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I asked you before about the ethic of a philanthropy. And I couldn't tell if you were saying to me that you are not concerned about it. To what extent are there now? another generation coming behind the one that we were part of who are as committed philanthropically to supporting Jewish life? Our growth has been extraordinary uh, in, in our donor base and our campaign. Uh, you know, 16 years ago we were at $18 million and today we are $121 million. How did um, that happen? I, a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of hard work and a lot of excitement, a lot of lay leadership. Uh, we have a, not a big staff, and so it's a great staff, but it's, a, it's a thousands and thousands of lay leaders that are excited to tell the positive story. And we're winning the fight of saying that we don't have to talk about Israel as, oh, my gosh, you've got to give because it won't be there tomorrow. Why would you buy the product? Okay? Um, and Israel doesn't need, oh, you know, they need socks. Guys, it's not third world. Yes, there's poverty, and yes, we should take care, and we have the opportunity, the responsibility, but it's a great place. You know, they talk about tourism to Israel. I don't know who would go. If you read an advertisement for most Jewish organizations, it sounds like, why would I go to that? Bangladesh I could go to. It's not fair. 
It's not fair. It's not fair to Israel. It's not fair to us. So I see young people wanting to be part of this great venture, this great journey, this great romance. They want to be part of the decision-making process. Let them be part. Open up your doors. Open up your books. Let them be part of that, that, that decision-making process. Let them, their brain power, I tell my staff all the time, you know, I think I'm a great CEO, but by the way, Microsoft never called me. So I have people like uh, Jeff Levine, my president, and others who, by the way, woke up in the morning and made a lot of money. I think they did because they had brain power. I have this great opportunity. They give me money and I get to use their brains. Mm -hmm. That is what the generation is looking for. Don't just tell me to show up with my money and to shut up. What am I? Show up with my money, of course. Be involved. Be engaged. Okay. You didn't answer the specific question. Are you worried about the ethic of the younger generation? No, not at all. Because? I think they're the greatest generation coming up. I find them to be the most exciting generation coming up. I travel the United States. I'm going to be in Phoenix, Arizona in March. We're going to have a JNF Shabbat that's coming into Phoenix, Arizona, where they thought there was no young people. There are going to be hundreds of them there. I see them hundreds in L.A. leading breakfast that we have, that standing up there with people from different generations and, and, and being able to hold their own. I see young people who are giving thousand and ten thousand and hundred thousand dollar gifts. Not the ethic of fun of giving. I think that they are so in, wonderful, so involved, so engaged, so knowledgeable that, wow, we better be ready because they are leading the way. Mm -hmm. When you saw Pew and people read it and there was a profile of the Jewish community today that gave many people pause, what was your reaction to Pew? You know, I'm, I'm not that old, but I read a study that was done in 1960 of the Jewish community. And in 1960, the great study of the Jewish community said that within uh, 20 years, Orthodox Judaism would be dead. Uh, conservative Judaism would be the majority. Reform would be uh, a sidebar. And we would be lucky that we're going to have uh, two and a half to three million Jews left in America. That's 1960. Well, the only thing that ever came out of any study in 1960 was rock and roll was here to stay. So orthodoxy is far from dead, it's the growing part, and I won't go to the others. But we are seven and a half to eight million Jews in America. Now, even that number is, a, is an issue, because the number is eight. If you take the number by communities, but we love to try to tell how bad we're doing, so we even keep that number down. <laughs> and it's not fair. You know, if somebody's raising their hand and say, I'm a Jew, I'm a Jew. And I see that happening. So what I find is that people don't want to, and I don't understand it. I just don't understand it. Because Pew is, is a study, if you really dissect it, and then see what people are doing. So Pew says, um, this is not doing so well. So let's do more of what we were doing that made it not so well. If you were in business and you had this cup and nobody's buying the cup, well, what we do in the Jewish community is we keep buying more cups because we're going to tell them this is what they should buy. How about listening to what they want to buy? Mm -hmm. Don't try to sell them anything. Pew gave us a different kind of roadmap, I think. I think Pew challenged us and said there's an engaged people that want. Quit selling. Help them buy. Mm -hmm. You know, my father, who was one of my great teachers, uh, always said when people came to a store, he told the salespeople, you don't sell them anything. They drove here, they got out of the car, you got to assume they want to buy, help them buy. We have young people, we have old people, we have people. They're coming into the store. Let's help them buy. One more question. As you've experienced the intermarried couple and the non-Jew married to the Jew, it's one thing to read Pew, but there's a real life situation where you're dealing with people again. And what's been your experience with families? Very often you don't have two Jews. To what extent have you been able to both mobilize and galvanize? So I'll probably get in trouble with one statement I'll make, but I will tell you that we did our study of our donor base, donors. 
and out of our donors, it said that in the demographic uh, research that you do with it, that 40% of the donors had someone in the household who was or is not Jewish. Right. Now, that's an amazing number. Yes. That's 40% could, by the way, they could be Orthodox. They could be convert, convert and be Orthodox today. And it doesn't mean their children intermarried because they're not in that household. Okay? So it's just the household. Now, that's 40% that we gained. We didn't lose. And you want to look at it as that we lost? I don't believe so. I go to, uh, I, when you go to a congregation and they say, you know, it's full of people. I say, well, I'm impressed. I say, well, you know, 20% of the people here are, are intermarried. I said, but they're here. The decision was made. So I know that I would be in a great debate with people about is that a positive, a negative, and I'm not going to get into it. Again, it's beyond my pay grade. I do know that we have a tent. And people are walking in the tent. And I'm not going to get into halachic uh, issues, and that's for somebody else. But in my world is this. I have the spirit of my connection of my Judaism that goes back, as you know, the six generations here in America and the thousand generations or wherever they, they, the original came from. And I'm here. And I have a responsibility to engage and involve and to dialogue and to excite and to bring the spirit of my life and my Judaism and my verb to them. And if they want to be part of my sing-along, by God, sing with me. I will always sing with you. There's no one like you. The audience should know, by the way, you've been an extraordinary friend to me and to this television network from day one. I cannot thank you enough for all you've done, but I am in awe of what you're able to create in a most unique way and it's not like you do it alone but you know it does come from the top and you've established a personality and a vision for JNF you deserve so much credit you should go from strength to strength called Tuva Hatzlacha and all you do I want you at this table often and I appreciate you and I love you very much thank, thank you, you very much thank you Russell Robinson CEO of the JNF the Jewish National Fund, you have now a sense more of the extraordinary work it does and why it has been so successful. Russell is, again, a unique presence on the world Jewish scene, and we are so lucky to have him, and I'm so lucky he's a friend. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to anything Russell said. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.